Let's take our Bibles today and open to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, let's begin in verse number 1. The Bible says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall He speak unto them in His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry, and you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. I want to make my main text, verse number 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Do you know, or you do realize this morning, I'm sure most of you do, that the Bible is not written primarily to show you how to be saved. The Bible is not written primarily to teach us how to have church on Sunday morning. The Bible is not written primarily to share God's love with mankind. Some of you are looking at me like, where are you going with this? The main theme of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, is the kingdom. Who is running things? You'll notice in our text, verse number 6. We see who's the king of the hill. We called it growing up king of the mountain. They got some blasphemous show on TV. If you watch it, don't tell me. It's called king of the hill, I think. Very idea of adults watching cartoons. But anyway, Jesus is the king of the mountain. The theme of scripture has to do with a king and a kingdom. And we, when we play king in a mountain, we get up on top of that hill, and you think you got it all together, and you got it there for anybody else, and some guy, he might even be smaller than you, he comes and he grabs you, and he gets you off balance, pulls you down, then he gets on top, and he's the king in a mountain. Well, when you go through the Bible, you find out that the theme of the Bible is not John 3.16. Thank God for John 3.16. The theme of the Bible is not God's love to mankind. Thank God for God's love. That's where we get in on things. But we're talking about a book, not a religion. We're talking about a book, not a church. We're talking about a book, not interpretation today. This book right here, the theme of this book, and I can tell you having read it a few times, is the kingdom. I don't want to preach on that this morning. Now, when you think about this, you have to understand the word kings appears 334 times in the Bible. The word kingdom, 342 times. The word kingdoms, plural, 57 times. The word crown, 66 times. The word throne, 176 times. The word thrones, plural, 9 times. There are four books in your Bible called the book of the kings. One of them is 1 Samuel, one of them is 2 Samuel. Look under the titles, it will say 1 Samuel, otherwise called the first book of the kings. Then you have 1 Kings, 2 Kings. That's four books called kings. And then you have 1 and 2 Chronicles that deals with the kings of Judah. Just the books of the kings total 93,729 words. The word saved appears 104 times. The word born again, three times. John 3.16 is not found in all four Gospels. It's only found in John. I just want you to understand the theme of the Bible. We're going to get to some practical application. But you've got to get this if you're going to understand understand anything about how God is dealing and has dealt with mankind and why we have all the religious systems we have and why we have the turmoil with the nations and the politics and all those things, you've got to understand the struggle and the situation dealing with the kingdom. Go to Genesis chapter 1, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter. You're going to be turning a little bit. I hope you bring your Bibles to church. If you can't turn, you just want to sit and listen, jot these down. You may be able to go back and look them up. And if we we turn to too many and you can't, like I said, just sit back and enjoy the ride. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Genesis 1, verse number 1. Obviously, most of you know Genesis 1. don't have to turn there. 
Genesis 1, verse 1, you know what it says. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning. Now look in 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you want to back up to verse number 24. We just read about the beginning, Genesis 1, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then cometh, what? The end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. And power, For he must reign till he hath put down all enemies under his feet. Verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. Which did put all things under him. Verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him. Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. The kingdom starts with God, and it ends with God. That's a good starting place, God. That's a good place to start as a kid. As a young person, a little kid, start with God. About six, seven, eight years old, when you realize you're a sinner, go ahead and get saved about six, seven, eight years old. Then when you, and, and let God be number one in your life. And then when you hit 9, 10, 11, 12, just keep God number one. You hit 12, 13, 14, 15, then start developing that relationship on your own. So by the time you hit 18, 19, 20, you already know how to pray. You've already read your Bible at least one or two times by, your, by the time you're 15, hopefully. And then God's the beginning of your life. Before you even think about getting married, put God first. Say, hey God, send me the woman that you've got prepared for me. God, I'm going to think about a career, but I want you to be first, so don't put me in some career that's going to have me in a place where I can't even go to church. Because you're going to be first, and to facilitate you being first, God has put church in our life. Church don't replace God, but it should help you to put God first. Live your life with a good testimony as you work in that job and career and raise your family with God first. God in the middle and God at the end. Then when it comes time to die, you know what? You'll leave this life here. But you started with God and you're going to end with God and you'll be up there with God. So the start of the kingdom was with God, but there's a struggle with this kingdom. Genesis 1, if you'll look in verse number 2, and go ahead and turn to Ezekiel chapter number 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 and Genesis 1 verse number 2. Obviously we know when God does something, He does it right. When God does something, He does it perfectly because God is perfect. God is holy, He's righteous, He's pure, He's clean. Everything He does is good. So when God makes things, He makes it right. You say, well, preacher, if God is great and God is good, why the suffering? If God is great and God is good, why is there evil? If God is all-powerful and God is good, wouldn't He stop all the suffering? Well, we need to back up before we even get to that question. Because God is great and God is good and God makes everything. He makes it right and perfect. But there's another factor. There is a struggle for this kingdom that God made. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 and Ezekiel chapter number 28. And we'll be turning in some other places. Look in Genesis 1. We'll back up and read 1 so we can get the context. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. See, in verse number 2, the Bible describes something that took place without form and void. We don't have time to run those references, but when you run the references of without form and void, it's not a positive thing. That's like saying, uh, you know, destruction, judgment. Desolation. Those are the same type of words. And so when you read those phrases in other places, Jeremiah 4 namely, it mentions a future destruction where stuff's just obliterated. Without form and void is not how God created everything. God creates things. The Bible says He formed the earth to be inhabited. God makes things. He makes it right. He doesn't create something that's without form and void. Without form and void is definitely a period of destruction and judgment that took place on this earth. You say, when? I don't know how far back that goes. I don't know how far back Genesis 1-1 goes. I know the heavens made before the earth. Even science tells you that. 
Science tells you the universe and the, the, uh, the stars and all that stuff is older than the earth is. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Something takes place in verse number 2, and he says, what is it? It has to have something to do with the struggle of the kingdom. And the struggle of the kingdom is not just a problem with the kingdom, it's a problem with the king. And that is God. Who is antithetical to God? Who is the opposite of God? The person we, don't, we want to act like he doesn't exist. You know, we get all involved in social media and images and stuff. This person I'm talking about, that's his field. His whole field is images. You say, who am I talking about? I'm talking about your adversary, the devil. Look in Ezekiel chapter 28. Here he is. You say, you're talking about the fallen angel. He's not an angel. He never was an angel. He appears as an angel of light in his deception in the Garden of Eden. But he's not an angel. He's called an anointed cherubim, which is an angelic creature, if you will. It's a creature that is not a man. It's a creature that God obviously made. And you'll see it here in Ezekiel chapter number 28. Come down to verse number 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Obviously, that's not the king of Tyrus. Of course, I don't know what he looked like. He might have had a big nose. I have no idea. But he's not full of wisdom. Many times you'll notice when God will be talking to somebody, just like when Jesus looks at Peter, he says, Get behind me, Satan. And he's talking to Peter. He will address the devil in somebody. And that's what's taking place here. Verse 13, how do you know that? Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. The king of Tyre in 500, AD, 500 B.C. was not in the garden of Eden. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was I covering. The sardis, tobaz, diamond, peril, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. So he has musical instruments in his very body, verse 13. Verse 14, who is he? Thou art the anointed cherub. We read about other cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. This is an anointed cherub, and he says, that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. There's that mountain. King of the hill. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. When you read about that throne, there's as burnished brass underneath that throne of God. There's fire there. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise... They have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. Look in Isaiah chapter 14. Go back to Isaiah 14. Isaiah chapter 14. So Ezekiel chapter 28 describes a struggle for this kingdom. This gives you insight, as far as chronology goes, to the history of the universe. The history of the universe begins with God. And it begins with God as king of the hill. And then it begins with the history of Lucifer. And you read about him in Isaiah chapter number 14. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12. Satan's name before he sinned was Lucifer. And that's a word that means light bearer. It's from a Latin word meaning, meaning light. And so he bore the light of God. Now you read about what it looked like over in Ezekiel chapter 28. He's this cherubim. And by the way, just for the sake of time, Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, the cherubim has four faces. Face of a man, face of a lion, face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. That's a strange idea to think about. Then it's got these four, wing, these, uh, four wings. And then it's got these wheels that's connected with, with eyes in this wheel where, where it goes. And it has these little hands under these wings. A seraphim is a different type of angelic creature. By the way, as far as Creatures in the Bible that are spiritual. You have horses that are mentioned in Revelation. That's obviously something different. But you have these cherubim, you have seraphim, and you have angels. And out of the angels, you have one angel called Michael. He's the archangel. No other archangels are mentioned. Then you have Gabriel. He's the only other angel in the Bible that's mentioned. And, and they're all male. Angels are always male in the Bible. No female angels. And angels never have wings. They're never described as wings. Anytime a person sees an angel, they think they're a man. They look just like a young man. Now, this cherubim is a different looking creature. And this one here has all these stones in his body. These 12 stones, probably representing the constellations and so forth. But here's these stones in his body, and he's said to be Lucifer. So that light, if he covers the very throne of God, that light is coming off of God, and it goes through his, his very being, and it bounces off, and all those colors go all the way out through the universe. Satan's job was to reflect God's light throughout the whole universe. This is before sin ever entered into the picture. 
Look in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Now you know why He hates you. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You reflect my light because Song of Solomon, the Bible says, He's the sun, we're the moon. The moon reflects the light of the sun. Moon's always feminine, right? The church is feminine. We're supposed to reflect the light of Jesus Christ, so now we're doing what the devil used to do. Look in uh, Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Uh, I saw something the other day. They were flipping through. There's some show. Isn't there some TV show now named Lucifer? People are bold, aren't they? And see, nothing means anything anymore. You know, you think, oh, I'm just going to watch this. You know, they don't mean it like that. Just, well, why are they using the word? Does it not bother you? That they're going to extra- extrapolate these, these words. Words have meanings. And I mentioned this the other day. Now we're in a culture that's visual. You want to watch a video, then you want to interpret it and make up the words to match the video. God said, I'm going to give you words, and in your mind, you're going to come up with the image to match the words. That's how God made you. And now we've turned everything into images, and we're going to interpret what we see and come up with the words to describe that. That's exactly how Satan's going to deceive this world. You better watch those images. I'm telling you. What about the Ten Commandments? What is the first thing God says? Don't make any images. Now we have moving images. Revelation 13, there's an image that comes to life and people can touch it. And it can touch them. And it gives them a mark. And they probably like that mark when they first get it. After a while, they want to take that mark off and they can't. And they realize that mark don't even go, to, it goes a lot deeper than the flesh and it goes down to the soul. Look in Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation and the signs of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Look over in Second Peter chapter number 3. There's a struggle for the kingdom here. And you have to understand all this, really, if you're going to get into understanding the Bible, because before sin ever enters into the world, it enters into the universe. You see, all the stuff that we're dealing with and taking place now, it all comes from Adam. The Bible says, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. It comes through Adam. And uh, your father goes all the way back to Adam. My father goes all the way back to Adam. So our blood goes back to him. The sin's in the world because of Adam, but sin's in the universe because of Satan. And there's a judgment that takes place when Satan struggles to try to take this kingdom over. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You say, preacher, that's describing Noah's flood. Well, if you'll back up verse number 4, and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Do you know when Noah lived? He didn't live at the beginning of the creation. 1,700 years after Adam was even made, was Noah around? 1,700 years before the flood. This is not describing the flood of Noah. This is a judgment that took place on the earth with Satan, and Satan's connected with this world. That's why the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 4, Satan is the god of this world. I'm telling you, the theme of this book is, who's the king of the hill? Who is on top? Who's running things? Satan had a connection with this world. And when he sinned and God judged him, he judged him and this world for it. Not only do we have uh, cataclysmic universal judgment that took place in the, in the universe. I mean, you go study the things that NASA tries to send you. You say, oh, this is so beautiful. It's, it's a graveyard, man. You look out and look at what they show you out there. There's nothing. It's just deadness. They say not even sound travels out there. You get up there in outer space, and you, if you were able to breathe out there, obviously you couldn't. Sounds, you're not even going to hear anything. Sound can't even travel. I can't comprehend that. I'm not a physicist. I don't understand all that. 
It's, it's dead. It's decimated. But not only cataclysmic, universal judgment, I want you to understand there's geographical judgments that took place to this very earth. So you think, well, preacher, the earth's pretty old? It may be really old. You say, why? Because Satan was on this thing way back before man was ever created. Take your Bible, if you will, and go to Genesis chapter number 3. Now, if some of this is a little bit heavy for you, just jot the verses down and try to refresh yourself. Some of you are like, Preacher, I know all this. You're wasting my time this morning. Well, I really felt I needed to do this, so this is kind of the direction we're going. But sometimes we need to be reminded about the Bible. If we can't be excited about the Bible anymore, if we can't want to study the Bible anymore, we've, we're wasting our time. I'm just not going to come in here and give us some little devotional thing each and every week. We need to be on fire and excited about learning the Bible. This isn't about the Baptists or the Methodists or the Episcopals or anything else. This is about what does the Bible actually teach? What does it say? We've gotten to where we don't really care about studying the Bible anymore. And if you don't get these foundational truths from the beginning, about the beginning... You're, you're going to be all messed up when you study prophecy. You're going to be all messed up when you study the history of Israel and the formation of the church and how all those verses can't be put together. You're going to be so confused. No wonder there's so many denominations. Genesis chapter number 3. Notice the temptation here when Satan tempts Eve. In verse number 5. Back up to verse number 4. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Notice the specific wording of your Bible. If you have a Bible that says capital G-O-D, you need to get rid of it. So a preacher, they translate it from the word Elohim. You really think you know something, don't you? The word Elohim can be translated all kinds of ways. And it can be translated God's. They knew exactly what they were doing right there. So what do you mean? Go to the book of Job. Job chapter 1. Satan said, you, do, you eat this fruit, you're going to be like these gods. Look in Job 1. There's somebody else other than God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that knew good and evil. And they knew good and evil before Adam ever knew good and evil. Look in Job chapter 1. By the way, Job is the oldest book in the world. It, it was written before Genesis, obviously, because there's no mention of... of uh, he may have been a contemporary of Abraham, but Moses wrote Genesis. He wrote the first five books of the, Moses, uh, first five books of the Bible around 1500 B.C. And obviously the, the Torah, the law, is all through there. Job has no mention of the Old Testament uh, uh, law at all. So Job's old. This book's old. Like I said, the oldest book in the world. You'll notice in Job chapter 1, verse number 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro the earth, walking up and down in it. You'll see it again in chapter 2. Look at these sons of God, verse number 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. What kind of company is Satan keeping? He's keeping it with these sons of God. Come over to Job chapter 38. Let's try to define who are these sons of God. Job 38. Job 38, verse number 7. If you back up and get the context, Job is being answered by God. And God saying, who do you think you are? You don't really know what you're talking about. Gird up your loins, verse number 3. I'm going to ask you some questions. Verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Verse 5, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When, verse 7, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You know those physical stars you look at? The Bible descri describes them in the book of Psalm as angels. And he says he calls all those stars by name. The sun in the Bible is a type of Jesus Christ. We know that from Psalm 19, from Malachi chapter 4. The moon's a type of the church. The stars have to be representative of something. And the Bible says they're representative of, of these angels. You ever heard of a black hole? A star that implodes, a star that dies out. 
The Bible speaks about fallen angels that they are reserved in chains of darkness. They're in a place called outer darkness. They've discovered recently a thing called dark matter. The dark side of the force. <laughs> so here you have Satan. And you have these sons of God. These morning stars. These angels if you will. Genesis chapter 6. Go ahead and be turning there. Satan whenever he tempts Eve. How come you haven't been seeing this stuff when you read your Bible by the way? Look when you read your Bible if you come across stuff. The problem you say preacher I've read my Bible you know three times a year for the past 10 years. Okay that's great. But have you read it the same way for the past 10 years? You ever do one of those experiments where they hold out this sentence and it'll have, it'll say, what's wrong with this sentence? I wish I, I brought an example. And it has a couple of words and the word right here will have an extra letter on it. And then it'll have, and you'll like, and there's nothing and, you, and you're reading it a certain way. And you can read it over and over and over and you keep reading it the same way because your mind gets locked into how you're seeing it and you're not even seeing the misspelled word. Sometimes we just go through the Bible, we just read it just like we've always heard Mama and Papa talk about it and we're just going right through there. You know, Satan, he was an, old, an angel. He was a good old boy and he got kicked out of heaven. Where's that at? Yeah. Surely you're not reading the same Bible I'm reading. Amen. He was anointed cherub that covered him. The cherub is not an angel. Amen. So we make sure we really read the Bible when we go through it. So this is maybe a wake-up call for us to realize some things. Genesis chapter number 6. Look what's taking place. This is 1,700 years near about after because this is the time uh, right before Noah's flood takes place. 120 years before that. And God tells him you need to build this boat. But notice the specific detailed wording of this. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Preacher, that means there were saved people marrying lost people. Let's keep reading. Verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. The Lord says, Well, saved people they have, they might be flesh like these. Really? Yet his days should be 120 years. Verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when... The sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And what does God do? He floods the place out. And we don't have time to turn there, but Psalm 82 is a reference where it says, God standeth among the gods, plural. These sons of God had a status somehow in connection with Satan. We know Satan is called the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. They had a connection, a status as gods, and Adam and Eve saw them on the earth. Where do you think all these religions come from? Where do you think these, these mis, mis, mythology, mythology of Zeus and all these crazy deities come from? They come from somewhere. They come from this stuff. Satan has a connection with those sons of God on this earth. When he tries to exalt his throne above the throne of God, God floods this place out. He judges this earth. There are geographic uh, 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 consequences for this earth. The Bible speaks of hell and the fire of hell being prepared for the devil and his angels. The Bible says those fallen angels are reserved in fire. There's a place that talks about outer darkness for some. There's a place that talks about fire. Those that sinned in the time of Noah. They're reserved in the center of this earth. Job 28 verse 5. Matthew chapter 12 verse 40. Acts 2 27. Those are verses that tell you in the center of this world, there's a place called hell. Amen. And it was put there when Satan sinned. The very idea that Satan's walking around the Garden of Eden sinless. That's what these young earth creationists are teaching, you know. Satan's in the Garden of Eden sinless. And then he sins and God's upset with him, you know. And then sin comes in the world through man. When did hell get put in the earth? When did a geographical judgment take place on the earth? The struggle for the kingdom. Job 41 verse 34, Satan is called a king. But come back to Genesis chapter 1. I want you to understand the significance of Adam here. Get uh, Genesis chapter 1 and Luke chapter number 3. I'm telling you, this stuff will open up the Bible for you. Genesis chapter number 1 and Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter number 3, the last part of Luke chapter number 3 with the chronology. And look in Genesis chapter number 1. We'll look in Luke 3 first. 
Remember we had these sons of God that were there when God created the earth. He's out there obviously there before the creation of the earth and the creation of man. They shouted for joy. They sang. And we have Satan over those sons of God. When the cataclysmic geographical judgment took place on the earth, they were judged at that point. When he creates Adam, the Bible says in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. In Genesis 1, 27, before he made him, he said, let us make man in our image. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Body, soul, spirit. God's got a body. You say, what's God's body? Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus. God has a spirit. What's that? The Holy Spirit of God. God has a soul. The essence of God is the Father. You can't see Him, can't touch Him. You can't see or touch your soul. You can feel the Spirit. You can see the Son. But you can't touch the soul. Let us make man in our image. So when He creates man of the dust of the ground, there's the body. Breathing into His nostrils the breath of life, there's the Spirit. And man became a living soul. He becomes a soul when the breath goes into him. At least a living soul, rather. Look over in Luke chapter number 3. All these genealogies. You say, preacher... When I get to the genealogies, I just skip over those. You don't do that when you read your Bible, do you? I will say this. Sometimes I have a hard time with those names. I'm kind of just, I kind of cruise, peruse and cruise. To peruse, if I'm saying that right, is to kind of go through something quickly. Peruse and cruise through the names, you know. Because they're hard to pronounce. And the reason they're hard to pronounce, I'll give you some insight here. You're getting these Hebrewisms coming through. Because these are Hebrew names, so that stuff's being... Uh, Hebrew's a tough language. You ever heard Dutch and stuff like that being... It's like, are you about to throw up a big loogie on me, or are you telling me something? Like, okay. And some of those Hebrewisms are kind of that way, so that stuff comes over into the uh, English, man. It's, it's kind of hard to pronounce. So you go through them chronologies real fast, but sometimes there's some nuggets in there. Notice the end of this chronology, verse number 38. Who was the son of Enos, who was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam. Which was what? The son of God. So what's the difference? He's made in the image of God. Look, some orangutan goes out and kills a polar bear. We're not going to have a trial. We saw something, we were at their house and saw something where this orangutan or this ape or something's on these power lines dancing across there. I was like, man, I was thinking in my head what they should do is attach some wire to him so it hits ground. Man, he'd blow up in a thousand pieces. You'd have orangutan lunch. Man, it just... Anyway, we don't have trial for that stuff. The reason it's a sin, and the reason it's a sin against God Almighty for a man to take another man's life is the connection between that life and God. We have devalued human life both in, as far as a baby is concerned and as far as old people. Now you get just a little bit old and you know, now we're going to make you wait till you're 67, 70, 85 to retire so we can get all your money. We kill them when they're young and we don't want them. And we kill them when they're old and we don't want to take care of them. Why? Because we've devalued human life and there's a connection between that and atheism. Because if there is no God, why do we, what's, the, what's the use of having any type of law whatsoever? What makes it wrong for me to go over your house if I can beat you up? Now some people I might not be able to beat up. I might not go to Brother Chris and try to take something he's got. But if I find some little pipsqueak, what's wrong for me going over there, taking everything from him, killing him, killing everybody he's got, and taking all his stuff? Animals do it. There's a God. That's what's wrong with it. God made man in his own image. And he says, you take a man's life. He tells Noah after the flood, he says, you need to shed that man's blood. Then in Numbers 35, when he gives instructions for them going into the land, he says, the blood can't be a cleanse of the blood that shed, but by the blood of him that shed it. He says he made man in his own image, and here he is, the Son of God, Adam. Now he's get this, John three sixteen. He's not the only begotten Son of God. He's the Son of God. See, he's not begotten of the Holy Ghost. He's made out of the dirt. He doesn't come from a virgin's womb. His blood is not God's blood. Jesus' blood is God's blood. Acts twenty verse twenty eight. He's the Son of God. He's the replacement. For those sons of God, Genesis 1, look at it. Verse number 28. God blessed them and God said unto them, it's Adam and Eve, 
Be fruitful and multiply. Look at this word. Very specific again. They knew exactly what they were putting here. Replenish the earth. Not fill the earth. You have a Bible that says fill. You need to put it in file 13. Trash can. Brother Ted's got some, some places you can go and, and, and put it on a burn pile. Amen. Like you said, if you're going to smoke a Bible, don't smoke a King James Bible. That's what the inmates were doing. They were rolling up Bible paper and smoking them. Now, If you're going to smoke a Bible, smoke an NIV, right? And don't smoke a King James. <laughs> That's what he told us, man. I couldn't believe it. Bad enough, they're rolling up paper, you know. But if you've got to do it, do it with an NIV. Very specific. He says, Adam, you're the son of God now. He says, I want you to multiply and replenish. Why? Because something was here before Adam. You've got to understand the whole, there's a whole lot more going on than your little life and Satan's just trying to whip me down and Satan's mean. There's a whole lot more going on. The reason he's after you is because he's after God. The reason he's after God, this thing is a big history to it. It goes all the way back. God made Adam the crown of his creation. And then here's Satan already have, in a fallen state, sins and tempts in the garden. What he does, he goes to Eve. Eve is made out of the heart. She's made to be ruled from her heart, not her head. Satan gets things out of order. You men in here, you're made to, you're made to be ruled from your head, not your heart. The women are typically more emotional. And that's a good thing. I mean, you don't need some woman that's... All emotional when you have some strategic thing going down and you need organization and logic taking place. She's worried about saving the pictures. And the fire, the building's coming down. you got to have somebody say, hey, we're going to do this, this, and this. You know what Satan does? He goes to, to Eve. She's made out of the side of man. She goes to Eve and she starts dealing with, his, with her head. And she deceives and tricks Eve. That's why she's not charged with a transgression. She's deceived. She doesn't willfully, willingly take the fruit. When Eve, when Eve says, Adam, why don't you eat this? He can tell something's wrong now because something happens to her. He says, why don't, he says, why don't, why don't you eat this? And he takes it. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he makes the choice. And he's charged with the transgression. Sin comes through Adam, not through Eve. But what I want you to notice about Adam, God makes him. He's the son of God. Notice, if you will, verse number 26 to 28 in chapter number 1. Or well, right there in 28, we were just reading it. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Look at this. Subdue it. Look at this. Have what? Dominion. That's what you say to a king. There's a struggle with the kingdom. And he says, Satan, you're not the king anymore. I've made a king down here and I'm putting a crown on his head. And I'm telling Adam right here, you be fruitful, multiply. You take this thing over now. And I'm putting a crown on your head. Satan says, oh, don't, you ain't doing that. You ain't taking my throne. Two reasons people want to be in, in control. Money or power. That's pretty much it. Very few, you'll find somebody that has some ideals. Very, very few and far between. Money and power. Satan says, no, he ain't getting my spot. Then you have the temptation. Job 41, 34, Satan is said to be a king over all the children of pride. Ezekiel chapter number 29, there's a comparison made with him between him and Pharaoh. And that's a passage where he's called a king. And that's a passage where he's said to be a dragon. And you read about that in Revelation. And when you read about this dragon that typifies Satan in the book of Revelation, not only now is he not an anointed cherub, this beautiful creature with all these jewels and so forth, he has devolved, if you will, or he has degenerated into this reptilian creature. That's why you read about a cow, a hoof, and all this kind of stuff over in Genesis chapter 3 because of the ox of the cherub in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. He goes from that to a serpent, which represents Satan. And in Revelation 12, guess what? That dragon has crowns on his head because it's about a kingdom. Now, there's a split that takes place in the kingdom. I'm going to go through this. Some of it kind of quick. We're not going to get to turn to all of it. So if you want to jot some of these verses down, I do want to come to a conclusion. When Adam sins, we know something bad took place. He took of the fruit and ate, right? And Jesus, or God had told, told Adam in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam takes the fruit and he eats, and he lives to the ripe old age. Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. 
of 930 years old. We are, we are proposed with these two scenarios. Either number one, God was a liar. Or number two, Adam did die. But he didn't die physically. God made him in his own image, right? Body, soul, spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says you have a body, a soul, and a spirit. So he made him in his own image. Adam, Adam had a body, soul, and spirit. When he took of the fruit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, something died. It couldn't have been his body. We know God's not a liar. As a matter of fact, the, the pronouncement of physical death doesn't take place until Genesis chapter 3 when he says, Dust thou art, and unto dust, you're going back to the ground, son. After he tells him, after he sinned, you shouldn't have done that. You're going back to the dirt. That's when the physical pronouncement of death comes. Genesis 2.17 is not dealing with the body at all. You say, what is it? It has to be the spirit. You say, why? Well, the soul is the real you. God gave you a body so you could be conscious of the world around you. I've said this a million times. You ought to be able to repeat it back to me. God gave you a soul so you could be conscious of yourself. Aren't you glad you know that you exist? I know that I'm alive. I know I'm here. I, I can see it. I can touch it. I know that's my body. But I know I'm on the inside. You ever get in a mirror and just start looking at those eyes? And then you start getting wigged out. You're like, oh! Somebody in there is looking at me! <laughs> Do that some. Just, just, just look in the mirror. Not, you know, oh man, I look good. Man, I look better than I did ten years ago. No. Look in those eyes. You're a legend in your own mind, some of you. Look in those eyes. You're on the inside. This is your shell. This modern materialistic world we live in tries to tell you that you are your body. Everything's about the body. You're on the inside of that body. There's a soul in there. And you have a spirit. God gave you a body so you could be conscious of the world around you. He gave you a soul so you'd be conscious of yourself. God gave you a spirit so you could be conscious of God. Because John 4 verse 24, God is a spirit. How are you going to fellowship with a being like that? Your spirit fellowships with him. So when Adam sinned, something took place to his spirit. That's why he went and hid from God. Instead of when God called him, him running up saying, Hey, can I sit in your lap, Dad? No, he's running from him. He doesn't want anything to do with God because now he has sinned and now there's a split in the kingdom. Something takes place, the spiritual part of that kingdom, where the physical part can have communion with a spiritual being, God, there's, it's been severed. And now people go around, where's God at? I don't see Him anywhere. I can't, are you telling me to believe in God? A God I can't see? Yeah, there's a reason you can't see. Because you don't have spiritual eyes. And until a person is born again spiritually, a person gets saved, they don't get saved physically. If that's the case, you'd never die physically. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Where's uh, the apostle, you know... John and Mark, and where's, where's Barnabas at? Surely they're still not dead because they have everlasting life. Surely they're around here somewhere. It's not talking about physical life. you got to get that. You didn't get born again physically. The Spirit was born again. John 3, verse number 5. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's evident. But that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Adam, whenever he sinned, he had a body, soul, and spirit. But something happened to that Spirit. It died. That, that, that cord was cut, severed. And so in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, You hath he quickened. To quicken is to make alive. Just like the quick, you have a live part in there. You cut, you get down to the quick, it hurts because it's living. The quick and the dead, the living and the dead. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So when you got saved, you know what happened? Your spirit was born again. The only problem is we still have the sinful body. So the split of the kingdom took place. But the physical kingdom went on. You have the kingdoms of this world. Luke chapter 4, you remember Jesus when he was tempted. All kind of things took place in that temptation that mirror what took place in Genesis chapter 3. He tells him to turn the stones to bread. He tells him to jump off the temple. He tells him to bow down and worship him. All three of those temptations match what Eve was tempted with. But what I want to focus in is what he told Christ when he said, bow down to me. He says, Jesus, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms of the world. And you can look it up in Luke 4 when you get home. He says, for they are mine... And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Wow. Satan says, I'm a king. I give out these kingdoms. 
So you have to understand the kingdoms of the world have some connection with Satan, but we also have a phrase that's used when Jesus Christ shows up called the kingdom of heaven. And we have a phrase that has to do with a physical, visible kingdom where Jesus one day will rule on a throne, literally, physically, visibly on this earth. When he shows up, guess what the angel tells? Well, before he's born, the angel tells, angel Gabriel, the messenger, tells Mary, he shall sit on the throne of his father David. You see that thing went from Adam, that thing passed over to Noah. He told Noah, you have, you have uh, uh, power over these animals and so forth. It went from Adam, it went to Noah, it went to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and then you had King David, you had the lineage of David. Everything's going great. God has these kings set up. And there's a struggle, obviously, because of the kingdoms of the world, what Satan's trying to do and so forth. And then you have all this lineage of David. And you get to a guy named Jehoiakim. He has a son named Jeconiah. He's so wicked and profane. God cast him out and says, I'm not even going to make him be buried with the burial of an ass. He's not going to be buried with the kings. As a matter of fact, God is so mad at this guy, he takes his name off of that guy's name. You say, what do you mean? J-E is representative of the word Jehovah. J-E in Jesus is Jehovah saves. J-E is Jehovah. S-U-S would represent saved. So that part of God's name, J-E, Coniah, he takes that off and he just calls him, calls him Coniah. And he said, of this man's seed, no man shall prosper ruling from the throne of David. There's a curse pronounced on the very seed that God passed the physical kingdom down to. So what happens? When Jesus is born, he's born of a virgin, so he bypasses the sinful seed of David's throne. Jesus is the heir of a kingdom. So what do we preach today? We preach a spiritual kingdom, a kingdom of God. If you get saved, you're born again in that kingdom. The Bible says we're translated from darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. The Bible says that uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Things you can't see. It's a spiritual battle. The kingdom of God, a good verse to jot down is Romans 14, 17. I'm trying to bring this thing to a close. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. But the kingdom of heaven, on the other hand, is a physical kingdom on this earth. You say, preacher, it says of heaven. Yeah, that's what throws everybody. But didn't we read in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth? Where is this earth at? It's surrounded by the heavens. The heavens and the earth which were of old perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, there's going to be a kingdom on this earth. And it's called the kingdom of heaven. The passage we read in Psalm 2 is describing Jesus as ruling in this kingdom of heaven. But before that takes place, there is a seduction of the kingdom that's going to take place. And in Bible prophecy, we learn about the man of sin, the son of perdition. He's the Antichrist. And he's going to come on the scene after the rapture of the church. The Bible says in Revelation 9-11, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. And you read about this king, Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 17, he has these ten horns. And all these things about these kings are in the book of Revelation because they're pointing to a one world ruler, which will be the Antichrist, and it's the seduction of the king. Satan is a counterfeit. This whole struggle for the kingdom and this whole idea of who's the king of the mountain, it, it's all through Scripture. Where are you going to spend eternity, heaven or hell? You can say it like this. Where are you going to be in eternity, with God or with the devil? The Bible says the devil that deceived them was cast into a lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse number 10. Where are you going to be, with God or Satan? The battle is an epic battle between God and the devil. There's a seduction. Satan's a counterfeit. He's called a god. He's called a lion. Jesus is called the God. Uh, he, he's called the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Satan's called a king. He's called a God. He has a city that's a bride. He's called an angel that appears as an angel of light, even though he's not a fallen angel. He appears as an angel of light. He has a son, the son of perdition, and his name's Judas. Judas is the same word from which you get Judah, where Jesus Christ comes from, the line of Judah. Lucifer means light. Jesus is the light of the world. He has ministers, just like Christ has ministers. He has angels. He has a throne, and he desires worship. Satan is a counterfeit, and Satan wants to take over God's throne. And what you find in Revelation 13, verses 15 to 18, is unified worship under this Antichrist. Revelation 19, we have the saving of the kingdom. Flip over there. We'll close right here. Revelation 19. At least maybe I gave you something to think about this morning. Verse number 11. 
Revelation chapter 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. We just read that in Psalm 2. And he shall rule rod of iron, we just read that. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'll close with a practical application. He's the king of the universe. You say, well, Satan's the god of this world, and all these things are taking place politically, and all this stuff with the Jews and Israel, and all that stuff dealing with prophecy. Satan's trying to do this. Satan's trying to prove God a liar is what he's trying to do. God told Abraham, he said, I'm going to give you this piece of land over here. The first time the word holy shows up, it's referring to that piece of ground they're fighting over. And he says, I'm going to give it to you and to your seed. And Satan says, I'm going to see about that. He's been going after that Jew ever since then, trying to destroy him. And so all the stuff of Bible prophecy relates to that, and all the stuff of the tribulation relates to that, because it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And so Jesus is going to come, and he's going to take things back over. And you say, preacher, all this stuff's happening. All this stuff, you know, Satan's going to do this and do that, and I'm feeling all this oppression and all this conflict and persecution and all these things we have to look forward to. This isn't a real positive message for the uh, National State of the Union. What a State of the Union address this could be, I mean. Well, God's still in control. As my grandmother used to say, God's still on the throne. What does that mean? That means Satan's just on a leash. As powerful as the devil is, and by the way, the devil is described in Job 41 in detail, and he says in that passage, if you could see him, you'd pass out. You couldn't even look at him. You'd be so frightened, you'd just faint. And Satan is so powerful, and when he stands in front of God, he has no respect for God whatsoever. He's made without fear, it says. He has no fear of God. But God is so powerful that it says in the book of Revelation, it just simply says the devil that deceived them was cast in a lake of fire. Boom. Just no, no, no effort whatsoever. God is still in control. So what's the moral of the story? The moral is God is the king of the universe. If you're not saved, you're not on God's side. If you're not saved, you're going to fall under some seduction and you're going to fall into this kingdom of this world that's becoming more and more visual oriented. You're going to fall into this type of seduction which is preparing you, if you're not saved, for the Antichrist. So what's the course of action? The course of action is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He's the king of the universe. When he died on the cross, what do they put up there? This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. It's in three languages. Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Shem, Ham, Japheth, the three known races. King of the Jews. You know what you need to do? You need to make sure he's your king. A thief looked over and said, Lord, remember thee. Remember me. Make sure he's your king. He's going to straighten all this mess out one day. Practically speaking, that ought to help us a little bit. The pressure's not on us to convert the world and to reform all the politicians. God forbid, you can't even reform the local politicians. Can I get a witness? Amen. You think you're going to straighten out the Washington politicians? You say, what's our goal? Our goal is to serve the king. He's going to set it all straight. He's coming back. And he'll have king of kings and lord of lords. I'm going to be on his side. Amen. Let's all stand and be dismissed.